here come the Irish. WeAreIndyNation.com is where you can go to get all your latest Notre Dame news, notes, and highlights on the season. Touchdown, Notre Dame! Featuring the new We Are ND Nation podcast hosted by me, Evan J. Thomas, and special guests throughout the season. No one comes into our house and pushes us around. Make sure you check out the Tailgater Show, the travels of Rudy the Golden Gnome, and more. Follow We Are ND Nation on the socials, WeAreNDNation.com. We Are ND Nation! Go Irish! What's up, everyone? Welcome to the We Are ND Nation podcast. I'm your host, Evan J. Thomas, and with me this week, Mr. Malik Zaire, former Notre Dame quarterback. What's up, my man? Man, thanks for always bringing me on, man. I love this podcast. Uh, not only that, but you, you yourself, what the hell have you been up to lately? You got like new little gigs here and there. I mean, yeah, man, we always keep it on 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 our toes. We actually um, coaching with Justin Utupo, former uh, Notre Dame lineman. He's a head coach at his alma mater, Lakewood High School, and I've been the offensive coordinator for his team. And our first game is tomorrow, so we've been pretty excited and getting ready with that. And then I'm also continuing to push the alcohol, Anora whiskey, the lucky lefty yeah. bourbon. Yeah, and I saw that. That's the uh, guy out in South Bend with you. And who is your teammate? Mark Tony. Tony, that's right. Yeah, who just, who just uh, you know, recently signed with the Raiders. And hopefully he makes that 53-man roster, at least gets on the practice squad. And another thing that I noticed, too, is you're a big foodie with all the crap that you uh, post on social media. Where did that yeah. come about? What's up with that? It's something about those uh, recipes that they put online, man. It's just hard not to share. Yeah, well, some of that stuff, man, you just, especially for somebody who likes to eat, but I don't like to eat crappy. It's like, it's one of those where it's like, oh my God, I just want to really just kind of eat more. But, you know, I try to stay away from it the best I can. Are you able to stay away from it? Yeah, I definitely uh, indulge in a little bit more than I would if I was playing, for instance. But uh, some of that stuff is just better to look at than I actually eat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that definitely is a lot better to look at than eat, especially for our hearts and metabolism and all that fun shit as we get older. So, yeah, especially we, when you're in the house a lot. <laughs> definitely. So we have a lot to actually talk about. We're going to get into talking about the expectations of the 2021 Notre Dame team. The new quarterback, Jack Cohen, who's taken over for Ian Book. We're also going to go over our game-by-game predictions. And also, we're going to play our Name That Former Player, which stumped you a few times last year. But, yeah, for sure. I'm up, I'm up to get that, uh, get that <laughs> done this time. I think you got one last year. I, I don't remember exactly which one it was, but I know you got one. Okay. So we're going to start off. I'm just going to say – Notre Dame last year, 2020, first time ever in the conference in the ACC, obviously because of COVID. They went 10-2, and 9-0 and in the ACC, lost to Clemson, 34-10 to in the ACC championship game, then lost to Alabama, 31-14 to in the Rose Bowl. Yeah. It was a little rough ending there for uh, our vaunted Irish. It's one of those things where uh... – it's the same thing like the girls' basketball team. They kept continuing to lose to UConn, but they were better than everybody else. So it took a superstar player like Arike to hit back-to-back game winners to get us over that hump. Mm-hmm. I think it's the same thing for us, and we're looking for that quarterback position to, to get it done because uh, Coach Kelly's done a great job still continuing to bring in top talent and the right pieces around. I mean, he's, you know, on the NFL side of things, he's been able to, you know, produce some really, some really talented guys, you know, this year with guys like Kyle Hamilton, for example, another bona fide first round pick on defense. And, you know, it's hard to do year after year going from man, man tied to Jalen to Jeremiah Wusu to now Kyle Hamilton to it, you know, you got first rounds almost every year. So, I think it's really awesome to see that. But uh, in terms of winning in the college football playoffs, it's going to take an all-star quarterback, just like it did the women's basketball team to have a Rike. And she's an all-star now in the the WNBA. Mm -hmm. So it just shows that real bona fide talent it takes to get over that championship hump. And not just real bona fide talent, but you're going against 
you know, an Alabama team that has basically 12 NFL players on the team, just as starters, you have Clemson who had, holy crap, like their top two players were basically first round draft picks in the first couple picks. So you had NTN, then you also had Trevor Lawrence, who was just an all world college player to begin with. So overcoming that and also the, the coaching and just, and I hate to say it, the overall talent of the other teams compared to what Notre Dame's roster had. It's not that easy to kind of overcome. But like you said, you have to have like a great day to beat those teams. It could happen. And they do just recruit, you know, I guess a little meaner type of player as some of those schools that, you know, maybe the, the aggressiveness is a little bit different. I think in those games, a lot of the times we just look less physical than the team that we're going against. Even when it came down to Georgia, I thought we we played well, but we were definitely less physical than they were, you know. So it's usually a combination of being the less physical team when it comes to winning that championship and also uh, that superstar just day, you know, they have to be all season. And going into this year, Notre Dame was uh, actually pre-ranked number nine in the Associated Press post preseason poll. And, uh, you know, the expectations for Brian Kelly, what I think he's in his 12th season now. And, I mean, he's going to have high lofty expectations being already ranked that high and with a somewhat, as I would say, easier schedule than last year. What do you think about that? Well, I think we definitely have a tough stretch for the, the type of team we have this year going against that North Carolina, Florida State, you mm-hmm. know, that that tough little five game stretch that we have. Um, I do think that'll be a good challenge for us to position ourselves for potentially maybe having a good bowl game this year, but from a championship side of things, you know, if we had just, for instance, Spencer Rattler instead of Jack Cohn, I think even the fans will feel like we will have more of a championship shot just do off of just the, the name on the paper, you know, and I think, we probably need something like that to really feel like you know, that that morale that we can get over that hump. But I think Jack is definitely very serviceable. You know, anytime you have a guy that has a lot of experience <clears throat> and then you put good pieces around him, you're going to give him a good chance to continue the success of what we've been going and, and, and improving, but also developing the young talent this year I think is a, it will be a, a premium for that next quarterback to come in, whoever that is. Well, you have, uh, like you said, Cohen, who actually hasn't even played for almost two years because he didn't play last year and then he got hurt the year before. So he's coming off of a foot injury as a senior. So, you know, we'll get into talking about him in the second segment, but we're going into Tommy Reese's first full season as the offensive coordinator. Last year, he did call some plays toward the end of the season. Um, how do you see uh, Reese being able to work with Cohen on the season and just the rest of the offense? Because, I mean, you got uh, Williams as running back, and that kid last year was just sick. Yeah, I think <clears> – I don't think they're going to try to reinvent the wheel. I think, if anything, Cohen is a, uh, it's very similar to Reese, so they probably have a lot of the same ideas on what is most most comfortable for both of them. I think in this season, particularly, it should just be geared, especially for Tommy to get a full season this year. To, it should be geared around your quarterback, doing it the way that, you know, you feel like is best working with your quarterback and use those young pieces around around him to make him look better. Uh, Kyron Williams is definitely a, a centerpiece of the team, but one of the pitfalls that we've always come into when we have an abundance of talent on offense is that, we abuse the the superstar that we have when there's a bunch of superstars that we can use down the stretch as well. So um, I'm saying that due to, you know, I, I would think Kyron has a good chance of an NFL career and, you know, having three, 400 carries going into your rookie year in the NFL. I mean, we've seen it impact our guys like Josh Adams and CJ Procise pretty heavily. So, um, Chris Tyree is a great back to hopefully get a lot more carries this year. And then, you know, Braden Lindsay, another guy uh, on offense that, you know, should have a breakout year. But I do think 
in terms of Tommy Reese having a full season, it should be centered around how can you make your quarterback succeed at the highest level uh, with the experience that he and things that he does know uh, and filter those those new guys in as much as you can and get them uh, some experience as well for the years after. And speaking of uh, new guys, you got freshman quarterback Tyler Butchner basically sitting on the bench behind Cohen learning from him. I'm kind of wondering if Cohen starts to falter. I mean, Butchner looked great in the uh, blue gold game. How soon can you possibly see him playing if Cohen kind of falters a little bit early on? Well, if I was running the team, honestly, I would I would start Tyler Buckner and use Jack as a way of really mentoring him through his first year and getting him ready to really take on what I think Tyler could really have a chance to do and and that's make a, a good run at at winning a championship, especially getting him comfortable early, knowing that expectations of this season isn't so much a championship, but to develop young guys as well as yourself to be ready to hit it hard the year after, um, especially when he has the ability to to continue plays like a little bit like Ian did, but he's a bigger guy. He's got a pretty good arm on him. And I think, uh, you know, if you look at the blueprint from Alabama and, and Ohio State and Clemson, they, they put their young guys in. I mean, even Clemson's freshman quarterback, DJ, gave us a really good run for our money at home. And he was a true, true freshman. So it just shows that uh, the ability that those teams have to get those guys that are five stars, that are highly touted to play early, it proves greater for them later. And, you know, Clemson's going to continue to be a, a problem because they've done a great job doing that. Oklahoma, the same way, has done a great job. Uh, Alabama, you know, with Bryce Young, is doing a great job. So um, that's just one thing I think we could learn from those teams we're struggling to beat. Uh, I, I don't think our team is in a position to win a championship over those teams just yet, but we definitely have the talent and in, in, in to have a great season. Definitely have the talent there. And to jump over the other side of the ball to the uh, defensive side, you have Clark Lee going into his third season as defensive coordinator. That defense, like you said, led by Hamilton, they are pretty stacked from front to back. I mean, talk, talk to me about what you think this defense can possibly do this season. Well, I really love the leadership that Marcus Freeman uh, is giving these guys for this year and, and how it's impacted recruitment. And the way he's been able to bring in major talent, I believe his what he's been able to do at Cincinnati is a, a microcosm of the what he could do at Notre Dame with even better talent from all over. And uh, Coach Kelly hasn't skipped a beat on on getting defensive coordinators that are, you know, in position to do maybe even head coach jobs. So uh, he's found another one with Coach Freeman and. He's young enough to to coach the modern game and he gets those guys and he knows how to get them to play at their highest level. And then on top of that, they want to play for him. Similar to Coach Lee, I know, uh, you know, Drew Wright had a great relationship with uh, Coach Lee previously. So I know that Marcus Freeman and the guys that he's bringing in and the guys that are there now can really rally around him for a first year defensive coordinator to have a really great defensive year in the country. Great, great take on that. And to move forward to the head coach, Brian Kelly, like we were saying, going into his, I think, 12th season, might be 11th. I got to look that up. I didn't research that. But uh, his legacy going into this season and what he can do potentially if they have a good season, where do you see him? Um, do you see this possibly as like a kind of rough year for him? Or do you think this is more of like a stepping stone to being like one of the best? Because he's – is he on the verge of beating uh, Era's all-time win record? I think he is. So, Yeah, you know, Coach Kelly is always going to go for the glory. You know, I think he he definitely um, is aware of the things that he's approaching on a coaching milestone. And I know he's full of charge and trying to get that done. So you can see it through the way he's been able to manage the team since the 4-8 and eight season. And um, – from a legacy standpoint, I know he really wants to 
get a championship there and, you know, have one of those statues in front of the stadium like all the other coaches. And he's really pushing for that. But I think in a sense, he's kind of like a Jerry Jones in a sense where, you know, he's too over control of it to where, yeah, the Dallas Cowboys probably the most talented team every year. We can't seem to get over that championship hub because Jerry Jones is almost in the way, you know, and I think a little bit of that plays for us as well, even though he's a great coach because um, his ability to, um, you know, impact the offense the way he does with quarterback competitions and uh, different um, ways of situations that he's been in games has definitely impacted some of the seasons that we've had and, um, it's always a common denominator if you if you do it if you add it all up and he's only got has been there the whole time so it's been a lot of turnover he's been able to withstand it in his in in the great things as a as a head coach position but you know sometimes you can be in the way of your own success at the same time well one of the things that I see with uh Kelly's legacy too is he's in the um he, he's in the era right now of social media as well. So could you have seen like Charlie Weiss early on or a Lou Holtz toward the end of his career being able to handle the pressures even more? I mean, they already had the pressures of being in Notre Dame, but the social media and all the chat rooms and all the groups and all the crap that people are talking, it just seems like it's more and more now and just more of a back and forth hatred love for Kelly do you think those other coaches would have been able to uh, withstand that like he has? Well, it's definitely a testament to his uh, his wherewithal to be able to sur- survive a lot of the social media stuff. But, you know, a guy his age, I'm sure he doesn't really tune in technologically to a lot of that stuff anyway. So similarly to these other coaches, I don't think they would be involved uh too much on their phones. You got to think as a head coach, especially guys like that, they're so hands-on with the program that they really don't have a lot of time to cut on the computer to see what Tim from Idaho thinks of what he's doing. (laughs) So uh, I think that's a testament to their their age and and the amount of time they've been into the game. And just, you know, older uh, coaches tend to, you know, have that, which may be a good thing not have that in in tuneness with the modern, you know, day player or the modern technologies of the world, because it's, it definitely causes a mental strain, as we can tell on athletes and everybody else these days. So maybe that's the one of the positives of being an older coach. Hey, you never know. Kelly might have a burner account out there, you know, talking shit about himself. So, <laughs> well, I definitely think is he probably does it in a different way. Maybe through the the articles and the journalists that you know do the media coverage. That's because that's more in person from that's on the phone perspective. Probably not. All right. Well, that is it for segment one. We all right now. We got to go into our name that former ND player. So I know, like I said last year, we did a couple of these. I think you got one out of four right. So let's try this one again. Yes, um, so <laughs> let me explain who this guy is. He's a wide receiver, was a freshman in 2015 and went through 2018. He played a total of 26 games, 77 receptions, 1,206 com- completed yards for his career and 11 touchdowns. He was also a third round pick in 2019 draft. Do you think you know who it is? Don't say who it is yet. But again, wide receiver drafted 2019. Think you got an answer? I think I got an answer. All right. We're going to take a quick little break. We'll be right back here with Malik Zaire, Evan J. Thomas. We are ND Nation podcast. Here come the Irish. WeAreIndyNation.com is where you can go to get all your latest Notre Dame news, notes, and highlights on the season. Touchdown, Notre Dame! Featuring the new We Are ND Nation podcast hosted by me, Evan J. Thomas, and special guests throughout the season. No one comes into our house and pushes us around. 
Make sure you check out the Tailgater Show, the travels of Rudy the Golden Gnome, and more. Follow We Are ND Nation on the socials, wearendnation.com. We are ND Nation. Go Irish! Evan J. Thomas back with you here on the We Are ND Nation podcast along with Malik Zaire, former Notre Dame quarterback. And uh, before the break there, we started and we talked about our name, that former Notre Dame player. And once again, I'm going to say, kind of list who he is, except for saying his name, position wide receiver. I didn't say his height and weight. So let's go with that also. Six foot four, 225 pounds. Maybe that might, you know, sway your decision a little bit. 26 total games, 77 receptions, 1,206 yards, 11 total touchdowns. And he was a third round pick in 2019 Malik who is named that Notre Dame player I'm gonna go with Chase Claypool drafted to the Steelers did I get it wrong oh my freaking goodness this this is ridiculous this is so ridiculous. close who is the other guy come on think about it LSU uh oh Miles Boykin my guy <laughs> oh my if I would have said that it would have given it away I couldn't do that that's your boy. <laughs> it's all right. Miles and Chase have such a similar career for me. They do. And it's and it's like it's scary because they're almost the same build. They they at Notre Dame they did some of the same stuff. And I both thought about both of them that we under underused them in a in a huge way. Well, Chase, his last season at Notre Dame was like so is Boykin, though. I mean, both of those guys together. But Chase is a uh, rookie last year in the NFL. Holy shit. Yeah, I like mean. He, you know, he, he overtook the number one slot with uh, the Steelers. Yeah, three or four. I mean, think about it. EQ, Chase, Miles, and and even Devin. Even Devin. So, uh, I mean. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, you know, go to Notre Dame, guys. <laughs> yeah, the wide receivers definitely are doing well coming out of Notre Dame. So that was our name, that former ND player. We're going to get into talking more right now about uh, the new quarterback who is scheduled to start game one. That is the one and only, not the one and only, but Jack Cohen. He is a transfer from Wisconsin. He's six foot three plus 220 pounds. He, Ian Book graduated back last year. So we have Jack coming in. And also we see the future of Tyler, is it Bushner? Buckner? It's Buckner. Buckner, I always say it wrong. So Cohen's junior year at Wisconsin, because he didn't play his senior year. He played in the Big Ten Championship game and the Rose Bowl as the primary starter. He was 236 for 339, 27, 27 yards total, 69%, 18 touchdowns, five interceptions at Wisconsin. You think he could match or even exceed – I'm getting messages too – uh, or exceed those numbers at Notre Dame in his uh, probably only season here. But looking at how Ian didn't have great numbers statistically in the, the high rankings like the other quarterbacks in the country did for their teams, uh, it's just it's going to be interesting to see what Tommy can cook up for his full control of the offense this year. Um, you know, I think Jack is just a a, a – a great piece to to maintain the development of the team in terms of not having a total tanking four and eight season. Uh, I think he has enough football wherewithal to kind of, you know, hang in there. And unfortunately, just because of the nature of our team and how Coach Kelly has been having us, it's not going, nothing is going to be real impressive until, you know, those one or two games close to the end anyway. So even if he has a pretty solid season, I mean, as a as a fan base, we're used to seeing that. It just can he win those games that really matter, which are always those one or two games during the season and then those playoffs or bowl game potentially. So that's just kind of where we're stuck in. Uh, a lot of it would just be what we're used to because we're kind of spoiled. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, we're not going to be very impressed even if we're pulling off wins until we can win a game like Clemson last year. Yeah. And like you were saying, putting up consistent numbers is always a good thing, but you could be putting up consistent numbers and winning like 18 to seven and putting up, you know, 212 yards, 
two touchdowns, an interception, but then you have the uh, running backs who are putting over 200 yards a game. So I'm actually thinking Tommy's going to be doing a lot with the offensive line and the running backs this year going forward because you are stacked at running back. So Yeah, and that's, and that's why we'll have those 7 to 14 games this year, you know, very similar to how – 2011, 2012 was, um, you know, we're just going to do what we're best at and he's going to game manage his way, you know, through the season pretty well, I think. I'm kind of with you on that. So we're going to talk about now some of our breakout players for 2021. I listed two on offense and two on defense. I have Chris Tyree and Braden Lindsay on offense. I have uh, defense. I have Ramon Henderson and Shane Simon. Who do you have as possible breakout players for this year? Because I'll get into my reasoning when I after I talk hear about yours. Well, I really want to see a, a heavier dose of Chris Tyree, and then uh, a main focus on Michael Mayer. I think he should just cap off what even Tommy Reese feels like he could be the best tight end through Notre Dame, and I think this this season should be about him on offense and and Kyron. So, um, and Chris Tyree should be that. That, that third piece to uh, really kind of keep that that running game sustained. And then Avery Davis, I think, having a more established role in the slot, giving, uh, giving Jack a good look after Mike's not open. I think he's going to be able to get a lot of chances with Avery as that, that fourth option. There you go. And uh, tight end you, as uh, we should be calling it for some reason, I think they have Iowa – a lot of people are saying tight end you, which they put out pretty good tight ends, but we've been doing it consistently the last 20 years. So it's been pretty damn good. That's for sure. Yeah. Just stay tried and true to that tradition. I think, uh, you know, Tommy Tremble and Cole Komet and Ben Koyak and Troy Nicholas and, you know, the list goes on. Well. <laughs> you got yeah, you can't forget yeah, you you know, got- so we got, we got the guys that, uh, make splashes and I think Michael Mayer fits right in line with those guys and uh, we shouldn't shy away from throwing him the football a lot. And one of my picks this year for uh, breakout players is Braden Lindsay. He was actually my breakout player last year, but obviously that hamstring injury didn't allow that to happen for him. So I see him having a pretty major con- contribution this year for Cohen or Buckner, whoever's at quarterback. Yeah, the great thing is that uh, he's going to get a lot of one-on-one opportunities knowing that team's going to think we're going to run the football, do a little play action. So his his ability to stretch the field uh, downfield is going to give us a chance to maybe potentially put some numbers up uh, if Tommy takes enough shots. And uh, I feel good with him taking those one-on-ones down the field. That's great. And uh, the two defensive guys I had, I had Shane Simon, who's going to be a linebacker, obviously picking Kyle Hamilton is almost too easy because that guy is going to be, like you said, first round pick after this next season. And then uh, also I threw in there cornerback Ramon Henderson. So he is fairly new to the team, going to see what he has to do. And he has uh, Hamilton on the other side of him. So it seems like it's almost in position for him to move forward as one of the next chapters at cornerback for Notre Dame. Yeah, I really want to see a cornerback stand out on our defense. I think that's one of the, a cornerback in our, one of our defensive ends to really stand out uh, this season consistently. Uh, that's been one of the few uh, missing pieces in terms of what we really need on a, on a threat level going into games each week. Our front seven is usually pretty solid, but uh, to have a dominant, dominant defense end should be our goal, uh, you know, just moving forward. I think that, has been a key recipe of success for teams like Ohio State with Chase Young, with teams like Clemson with their whole front four when they were winning championships and even with Alabama every year. So uh, a strong defense end is is really what it takes to what what the blueprint looks like from other teams that have been winning championships. Yeah, you have to have that badass that goes after the ball and the quarterback all the time. So Notre Dame's had them stacked the last decade, and I can see them just keep pumping them out too. So, you know, it got to have that. I mean, it's just part of the game, and that's what's definitely needed. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. No doubt. Okay. I didn't know what to say after that. So uh, we're going to take one more break. We're going to get back into the uh, last segment of the show, which is going to be our game by game and preseason picks for this season. So he is Malik Zaire. I am Evan J. Thomas, and this is the We Are ND Nation podcast. Thanks for sticking around. Here come the Irish. WeAreNDNation.com is where you can go to get all your latest Notre Dame news, notes, and highlights on the season. Touchdown, Notre Dame! Featuring the new We Are ND Nation podcast hosted by me, Evan J. Thomas, and special guests throughout the season. No one comes into our house and pushes us around. Make sure you check out the Tailgater Show, the travels of Rudy the Golden Gnome, and more. Follow We Are ND Nation on the socials, WeAreNDNation.com. We Are ND Nation! Go Irish! We are back here on the We Are ND Nation podcast. Evan J. Thomas, Malik Zaire, former Notre Dame quarterback. Our segment number three, the last one we're doing, we're going to do our game-by-game predictions and preseason final not standings. I'm just going to say just overall record. So do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Because I already have it listed on what I have. So Yeah, I think you should go first. Fuck, thanks. All right. So <laughs> this is what I have. Florida State opening game. Win. It's one. Toledo. Win. Two. Actually, I'm just going to go down the list. I have them winning against Purdue, Wisconsin, Cincinnati. So that's 5-0. But I have them losing in Blacksburg against Virginia Tech. That's five. I would more. switch that. I would actually do we lose to Cincinnati. Oh, at Notre but Dame. We, but so. we yeah, I think I think Cincinnati can, can get have that. a good shot of doing it. But then again, I mean, with Marcus Freeman being there just a year before, he probably knows those guys. I don't know. But I think that Virginia Tech game, obviously, everybody thinks it's a trap game, but I do believe that with Jack being experienced and the offense being how we are, being more talented, I think we'll pull that one out. So I think Cincinnati would be more of a toss-up for me, but I think we'll win that Virginia Tech game. So it was really tough for me to actually throw that L on Virginia Tech, but I felt like I had to throw one in there somewhere. Yeah. And I don't see but – you, But the thing is – you don't have to don't have to feel like that because honestly, you know, by the look on our paper and how we've been the last three, four, five years, you can kind of lock in that we're we're gonna make it look close, but we're gonna pull out most of those games. Yeah, and also it all depends on how the first week goes and the second week goes. See if we still have Cohen as a starting quarterback. See if we have Buckner taking over for Cohen if you know Cohen slides and you know kind of loses his uh steam so and that's what and i think that's what will mess up the season and make everybody frustrated in the fan base if we continue to do that i don't think coach kelly's forte is a a quarterback roulette or you know being indecisive on who's starting week to week i think his best football comes when he has a guy win the job and just rocks with him until the wheels fall off there you go. I like that too. So right now we have it, at least I do, five and one after the Virginia Tech game. Then you go into USC at home. I have that as a win. North Carolina, Navy, Virginia, Georgia Tech as wins. Stanford, the very last game, November 27th. I actually have that again as a win. So I have them 11 and one on the season, which not too many seasons of 11 and one, and I'm kind of pushing it. But I do have to say, the year they went 12-0, and 0, I actually picked that a couple of years really? ago. I did. Okay. Yeah. Oh, the year with Brandon and Ian, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think I had 12-0, and 0 too, just because we were just way better than the teams we were playing on paper. But those same teams are better now as well. You know, in North Carolina, I think um, they're going to be more consistent with Sam Howe, which – Anytime you're playing a, a potentially top drafted quarterback, you gotta you gotta worry a little bit. But he's playing at Notre Dame this time, so right. maybe that has some effect to it. But I think he's good enough to pull out wins. I mean, we had Trevor Simeon pull out a win against us at home as well. So it just shows that you know just about anybody with some good talent. I mean, he was good in that game, and they were dropping passes. Remember that? That was 
That was Please great. don't talk to me about that game because I was yeah, there that was, in the stands and it was like that was so great. But look at Northwestern now. I mean, Northwestern is really good. They I are. mean, I mean, apparently they went to the Big Twelve. I mean, Big Ten championship last year. That but, literally uh, was the worst game I ever saw live. Ever saw live, and they could have beat us by even more if they didn't drop all those passes. Like it was well, well not only that, but we should have. We were up by eleven points with three minutes left. You don't lose by by a field goal when you're up by 11. What a terrible – yeah, that was just <laughs> – oh, wow. That was – wow. But that that's what really got Trevor drafted. And, you know, it was. That was his game so. to get drafted. But all I remember is I had frozen feet standing there, and it was absolutely miserable. And just pissed. Like, everybody was pissed. It was such a stupid game. <laughs> you had the, what, but, you know, seven inches weird. of snow the night before? <laughs> you don't even need to be told. Yeah, we, I probably had the craziest weather conditions during my time at Notre Dame with how yeah. it was the most freezing cold at the Stanford game and Northwestern game was like that. BYU was like that. Uh, we had the hurricane at NC State, oh the Clemson game, <laughs> hurricane. You know, we you know we had. Well, you started that game, didn't you? The hurricane game. Uh, I played Shot. in the hurricane game. Yeah, you in, played in it uh, in the NC State game, but. Should have played a lot more. Maybe we would have won. No, it's true. So what? So what do you have them on the season? I I have them as eleven and one. What do you see them at? I got them at nine and three to be just because I don't think we're a championship team. So, I mean, I think we have championship talent, but I don't think we're better than the teams that are probably going to be fighting for it this year. So I got us nine and three, but that's still a good season. I think we'll break the top ten. As a finish, but nine and three with us losing, you know, North Carolina. I think we probably have a tough time. Um, it did say just some because these teams, just because these teams have bye weeks before they play us too, is we're like, you know, there's a lot of teams that got some bye weeks before they play us. I think, uh, like I said, North Carolina, Cincinnati may be a tough one for me, and uh, I think USC. You know, we always love to lose. Whoever we playing in California, if we play in Stanford, let it be Stanford. No, we're Whoever in uh, we're in, we're home for USC. We're at Stanford this year. Yeah, so then Stanford will probably be our our other one. So. That was that was a that was a 50 50 toss up for me, but for you me know, it's basically we play, how whoever we play at the end of the year in California, we usually lose that game. Usually, yes. Uh, to, when they went twelve and zero a couple of years ago, they actually won that game, so that was good and. I'm kind of hoping the way the season goes in my mind, if they are 10 and one going into the last game, I think they'll handle Stanford easily. Obviously if they're, you know, six and four or six and five going to that last game, that's just a throwaway. So yeah, you throw away the California game at the end of the year. Yeah, that's, that's basically a give up. So all yeah, right. basically, that sucks that we don't play for a championship, but that Stanford game, usually the California game is like either hit or miss for real. So. And what did you always like about playing in the California game? What was your favorite part? Just being I always there? thought we was going to win if I played, but we've always had opportunities to win those games. But it, it's something about falling apart at the end where maybe it's to everybody because we know we're looking for the bowl game or the championship. So, you know, they play younger guys and it's just kind of whatever. But um, the years I was involved in it, you know, I thought, it was encouraging, even though we should have won. Shit, we should have beat Sam Darnold. We should have beat Cody Kessler those years. So whatever. All right. Well, Mr. Malik Zaire, thank you for joining me once again. Uh, where can we find you on the socials? And where do you? Obviously, you have your games. First game tomorrow. You said Peninsula, man. We play Peninsula. Peninsula TV. Are you excited? You gotta be. Yo, first time offensive coordinator. I'm really excited. I, I got some real good plays, some good players. My quarterback's pretty good. Uh, you know, we got a shot. So, what what's your uh, go to uh, play? Let's see, uh, third and seven from the eight yard line. All right, we got a tight three by one cluster. We got a cluster right. We got flood X spin. So we got a five and out by your X. You got a 12 yard corner by your uh, H, and then you got a stick route by your tight end, backyard uh, dig route, and then you got your back coming to the field. So, I was going to say, is your back kind of like, you know, weaseling his way down the middle because you got these three being watched? 
Yeah, we just flooding the field. One of them, one of them boys gonna mess up, so then we gonna get an open shot. Got to got to do that uh, goal line drag, as I always call it too. Always oh, yeah. worked in Madden. I don't know how it works. Madden kick. a little different than real life. You know, you gotta get you gotta talk <laughs> the high school kids to do the same thing all at one time. So you definitely that's can. Easy thing. <laughs> awesome. Well, good luck tomorrow in your first game as offensive coordinator. Obviously, we can follow you on the socials. Give it out. You know. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, wherever we can find you. Yeah, just Malik Zaire anywhere, man. Oh, get in contact with me. Are you on Twitch as well? Uh, not Twitch, not yet, but I'm going to work on it. I'm trying to work on it, too. I'm I'm old, though. I'm like Brian Kelly. I'm not into that yet. but no, I get it. I get it. <laughs> and you can find me all over the socials, Evan J. Thomas, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We Are ND Nation is on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and also Twitter. And then WeAreNDNation.com. All right. That's Sounds it. Good, so until next week, we're gonna we're actually hopefully if you can join me, that would be amazing. If you can't, I understand. But we will talk about week one of the season, going into week one of the season. So uh let's hopefully rejoin each other and uh hopefully you'll be one and oh walking into next week. Let's get it done. I appreciate you, man. Thanks. Right, so much. Thank you, and thank you for listening to the We Are ND Nation podcast.